Hey everybody, welcome back to Weatherbox. If you're new here, it is wonderful to have you. Today's March 30th and it's actually 65 degrees here in Ohio, which typically means there's tornadoes going on somewhere in the deep south. So in honor of that, I thought we'd look at a day in history where the weather here was just a little bit worse. April 3rd, 1974, also known as the Super Outbreak or Super Tuesday. In 24 hours, 148 tornadoes across 13 states, killing 319 and injuring over 5,000. It was a day that really pushed meteorologists of the era to improve our forecasting technology. Meteorologists knew that the days surrounding the third could have the potential for severe weather, but the extent took most by surprise. The setup was pretty gnarly. You had a spiraling low pressure system to the west with cold air diving down behind it. Stretching to the east, you had a warm front which helped to lift the air upwards. At the surface, you had warm gulf air streaming in from the south. These factors produced a spiraling band of supercell thunderstorms, virtually every single one producing multiple tornadoes. This particular line of storms produced F5s that went through Brandenburg, Kentucky, DePauw, Indiana, Slayer Park, west of Cincinnati, Ohio, and Xenia, Ohio. This southern squall line produced the F5s that went through Ewan and Tanner, Alabama. So this is what the satellites above the Earth could see in 1974, but what could meteorologists see from the ground? In the 70s, the radar was much more suited for tracking aircraft, solid metal objects that could reflect a beam of radiation at maximum intensity. However, it could show you the outline of a storm with heavy rain, giving you its relative shape, size, and direction of movement. You could then, by hand, translate the location of that storm onto a physical map to see who did down the line was in the storm's path. If there was a very strong tornado in the storm, you might be able to see a hook shape on the storm's southern side. But you could in no way, shape, or form see wind velocity, which would show you rotation and where in the storm a tornado would be most likely to form. So ground reports of tornadoes were often critical to issue warnings for those in their path. So how did these destructive tornadoes unfold? The first F5 touched down at 320 Eastern near DePauw, Indiana, killing six people. Just to the south, around the same time, another F5 moved through Brandenburg, Kentucky, killing 31 and bulldozing the town. At 4.30 Eastern, another F5 moved through Xenia, Ohio, killing 32 and causing catastrophic damage. At 5.30 Eastern, another F5 moved through the western Cincinnati suburbs, including Slayer Park, killing three. At 6.15 Central, the southern squall line produced an F5 near Tanner, Alabama, killing 28. And then a second F5 carved a similar path through Tanner over an hour later, killing another 16 people. Finally, Finally, around 8.50 p.m. Central, an F5 tornado wiped Guin, Alabama off the map, killing 28. The Guin tornado was estimated to be the strongest in the entire outbreak and one of the worst in the history of the state. There were also 23 F4 tornadoes, which all produced an additional 119 deaths. Many people reported that the strongest tornadoes didn't actually look like a classic tornado touching the ground. They often just look like a lowering in the cloud base with a swirling debris cloud near the ground. This is a multi-vortex tornado, which is a tornado that contains several sub-vortices that spin around a parent vortex. They are among the strongest on Earth and produce erratic but catastrophic damage, as we'll soon see. Bruce Boyd, a 16-year-old Xenia resident, took this film of the clearly multiple vortex tornado hitting Xenia. Dr. Ted Fujita had theorized that multiple vortex tornadoes existed in his study on the April 1965 tornado outbreak, and this footage of the Xenia tornado all but confirmed they existed and were among the most violent. In the days and weeks after, planes flew over the small towns affected, taking aerial photographs of the damage. Thanks to the Ohio Department of Transportation Aerial Archive, we can actually look at the damage paths of the Xenia and Slayer Park tornadoes overlaid onto Google Earth. Let's go. This here's the town of Xenia, Ohio. It has about 25,000 people today. I think it had around 20,000 in 1974. I couldn't find an exact number. If you know, let us know in the comments. It's one of the few smaller towns in Ohio that are actually growing uh, pretty consistently in population over the past few decades. Might be because Dayton is not that desirable to live in. Sorry, 
date nights. It is only a few miles east of the Beaver Creek neighborhood, and uh, it's just a nice small town. And this is what it looks like when you stitch together all the old images of the damage path. Let's zoom in. The tornado touched down on the southwest side of town in this field, and it moved northeast. It hit maximum F5 intensity real quick. Take a look at this. Boom, right off the bat. That is the most textbook F5 damage you're ever going to see. You have houses that are completely swept off of their foundation with just the bare concrete laying here. All of the remnants are blown across the street. And as the tornado crossed Route 35, you can really get a good glimpse on just how large this multi-vortex wind field is. You have the center of the tornado here, which is pretty much peak EF4 damage. And then you have just like random roofs missing over here. And this is all from the sub vortices that are just kind of rotating around this parent center. Continuing to the Northeast, I really like how detailed and high resolution this film is because you can see all these old 1960s and 70s cars were just thrown in a pile on top of this house foundation. It's pretty cool. The tornado ran parallel to Bellbrook Avenue here. I believe this is a school. Uh, this tornado actually damaged five schools, nine churches, and 180 businesses roughly half of the structures in town. Moving towards the center of town, we have some kind of manufacturing business that had its roof ripped off, more houses that look like they were shoved into the world's largest food processor. And here we have the very center of town. This is the intersection of Route 35 and Route 68 and everything to the west and to the north. It's not looking too good. This is kind of weird here. The tornado just spared the Green County Courthouse. I mean, you can see a couple shingles missing and you go off the street and it's like, oh, the entire roof is gone. So that's pretty wild. This is another area where you can see the multi-vortex structure in the actual damage path. You have houses here and here and here, which look pretty livable, even that one. And then you got, you know, your EF4 damage, EF3 damage, you know, roof's gone, walls are gone, sort of scattered throughout. And it's like, well, why are those houses in the middle still standing? It's probably because they didn't get hit by one of those little suction vortices that just explode things. This is another one of the schools that was hit. I think it's the high school. I'm not too sure, but it does appear to be the largest one and uh, definitely took a direct hit. And the tornado leaves the northeast side of town pretty strongly. I mean, this is high-end EF4 damage here. From there, it runs pretty much parallel east-northeast along US-42 through a bunch of fields. And then it hit the small town of Wilberforce, which actually a lot of people forget that it happened. But yeah, a lot of these houses here, EF3, EF4 damage. And it actually clipped Wilberforce University. You see a lot of the historic buildings here. This one doesn't have a roof anymore, and this one doesn't have a roof or walls. So that's uh, it's pretty wild. Xenia actually did a fantastic job in the rebuilding process. On April 3rd, 1975, that's one year later, they rebuilt 80% of their houses and 40% of the businesses affected. There's definitely uh, some holes here from uh there's a big warehouse here and i think a school there that were completely destroyed um, but that's to be expected those things take years here we're looking at the damage from slayer park which is a small community a few miles west of cincinnati along the ohio river this tornado that went through slayer park appeared to be a lot smaller but the damage was still an f5 these houses in particular on the far north side of the community took the brunt of the damage they don't really appear to be swept off their foundation but all the walls are down the roof is gone it's just a total mess within five years of the super outbreak congress passed a bill to install a nationwide weather radio network involving 330 stations to get the warnings out to people 24 7. today the number of stations is over a thousand and the average lead time for a tornado warning has improved from minus 15 minutes to plus 10 minutes. So 48 years later, we're doing pretty good. Thank you guys for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe to push my videos out to a wider audience and comment your thoughts on the outbreak below. We've been talking a lot about tornadoes and death and destruction, so I think the next few videos are going to be about lighter topics, especially since the weather is warming up and it's getting a lot sunnier. I'll see you guys next Wednesday.